of the Shastra Shetu series titled as a primer on Vedanta for scientists. So the talk will give a bird's eye view of Vedanta, which is the science of Vedas and India's crowning theory of consciousness. And the seeds of new innovation and outlook it opens for modern world. Uh, so today's speakers will be Shri Padam Nabhan B, who will introduce us to the Vedanta and how it relates to Vedas, Darsanas and Shastras. Its key source text and why it is a theory and not a belief system. Uh, then uh, we have another speaker too, that is Srimati Hari, Jayanti Hari, who will then outline its key concepts and doctrines. She will also present different flavors of Vedantic thoughts and its relevance as of today. So I would like to hand over to Sri Padamnabhan. Uh, Hari Om. Um, let me start with a prayer. Sadashiva Samarambham, Shankaracharya Madhyamam, Asmadacharya Pariyantam, Vande Guru Paramparam. With the blessings of all the Acharyas who, has, who have given us the Shastras, with all the Maharishis and uh, with all our Gurus, um, to the Guru who, who covered us the Vedanta in the last semester at MIT, we offer our Namaskarams and we start this talk. Uh, today's talk will be as, is a part of the Shastra Setu series on Ved, demystifying Vedanta. So we are going to talk about Vedanta, where its place in Shastra. Shastra and the different aspects that are um, related to Vedanta. So it will be, uh, the first half will be covered by me and the second half will be, will be by uh, Srimati Jayanti Hari. And both of us are pursuing our MA at uh, MIT SVS. And a couple of uh, things on the logistics. One uh, would be, uh, you know, as Samit Varya has uh, said before, uh, please uh, post your questions on the chat window. Uh, our friend Amit Varya, who is our classmate as well, he has offered to help us and uh, will answer your questions. And definitely towards the end of the presentation, we would love to answer all the questions that we can answer. Uh, with that in uh, mind, uh, since we start this uh, lecture, so you are all familiar with uh, Vidya Sthanas. And in, so I'm just starting with a very high view overview of that. So the Vidya Sthanas are, um, there are 18 Vidya Sthanas according to the Shabda Kalpa Dhruma, and they are all based on the Vedas, the four Vedas. And out of the Vedas, uh, we see the Vedanta as a part of the Mimamsa Shastra. So the, there are different uh, components of uh, the, the Angas and the Upangas, which are all dependent on the Vedas, and the uh, Vedanta belongs to the Mimamsa Shastra. So let us understand what Mimamsa Shastra is. So Mimamsa means inquiry. So now we often hear the word inquiry in our newspapers and all those things, which is like a crime inquiry and all those things. They are all happening at a human level. But what this inquiry is, is more at the Shastra's level. So what, what does it mean? So Vedas are wide. It's called Anantavai Veda. So it is very vast number of text information is available all over the place. So there needs to be a comprehensive way of understanding the Veda so that the inquiry Shastras help us in guiding towards that. So the Vedas are broadly classified as two sections. Uh, the first part is called as a Karma Kanda, where the rituals, the Yajnas, the Yagas, all those information are being um, discussed. So when you want, when like when somebody wants a son, they do a Putra Kameshti Yaga. When they want rain, they do the Vrishti, Varuna Yaga and all those things. So those Yagas have uh, their own significance and the information has been collated and uh, the Puru Mimamsha Shastra inquires about it. And the second part of the Mimamsa, the second Shastra of the Mimamsa is called as Uttara Mimamsha, where it talks about the self, the association with the self is an individual, our association, it's all questions like, how, who are we? What are we doing here? And how are we related to the creation? Are we, related, are we really related to the creation? Or is something else? Or what is my, why, why am I thinking like this? So all these things have some meaning towards it. So there are deep inquiries into the self, the relationship, and the relationship with the creation. So the Mimamsa has two parts, as we said. This one is a Purva Mimamsa, and the other one is the Uttara Mimamsa. So, okay, so now as we understood the Mimamsa here, let's get into 
uh, another technical word. So some of these places we introduce some technical words and then we just uh, try to explain in over the slides and both of us have done it. And some of them I would be covering it and some of them will be answered by uh, Srimati Jayanti as we speak. So we see another word here called darshanas. So darshanas basically tell us uh, the, uh, the inquiry, uh, the, how the inquiry has been performed. So the, the, this darshanas are, are as seen by rishis. So tattvam drishyate anena iti darshanam. It is, this is what we call, this is, this is the definition of darshana. So what is tattvam? Tattvam is a philosophy. The philosophy as seen by the uh, acharyas, as seen by the rishis. And uh, that philosophy, is, uh, that, that's what we call it as darshanam. So in the Vedanta is a darshana. So the, in the space of Vedanta, we deal with the relationship between jiva, jagat and jagat karana. So what is jiva? Jiva is the individual like us, the people. Jagat is the existence and the jagat karana, the reason for this existence. What, how is this created? What, what is going on in this? And how do we relate, associate with ourselves? So these three parts are discussed in detail in the Vedanta. In general, the darshanas have an independence in inquiry. So when they do the inquiry of um, the various shastras, um, they have an independence. So the results may not be the same. One darshana can have one belief, the other darshana can have another belief. It's possible to have that. And uh, the references on the darshanas that we see is based on the life of those dashanikas, the people who uh, think about it, the, the people who uh, experienced about it, or the visionary about uh, vision, who we call them as visionaries. And we see in some cases, they reveal the, uh, the beauty or the explanation of the shastras through their yogic powers. And the most important thing is when it's not just like what they think about it and say that, but these are all proved by means authentic sources of knowledge, which we call as the pramana. So in this type slide, we see two different words. One is a darshana and the other one is a pramana. So we'll talk about pramana as we progress. So with that, uh, with that introduction to darshanas, um, we'll see what are the kinds of darshanas that are available to us. So there are two different, in broad, there are two different types of darshana. One we call them as Nastika Darshana and the other one is called Astika Darshana. So typically in a colloquial word, I mean, uh, what I have heard in the past is Nastika means don't believe in God and Astika means belief in God. But actually in the Shastras, we, where we see that is Nastika means people who don't take Veda as a Pramana. So the, the Veda Nasti, those who believe that the Vedas are they're not there, they're the Nastikas. And, who, and the Shastras who believe that Veda is the Pramana. So based on the Vedas, I, am, I can you know, explain my Shastra. So that is the Astika Darshana. So we have seen uh, multiple categories of Darshana. So some examples of Nastika Darshana are the Charvaka Mata, the Buddha, Buddha Mata, the Jaina Mata, and so on. So, um, so even though Buddha and Jaina believe, believe in God, they don't... Um, and the, they don't accept Veda as a Pramana. On the other side, in the Astika Darshana, where we see Nyaya, Vaiseshika, Sankhya, Yoga, Purva Mimamsha, Uttara Mimamsa, so I have um, the Rishis who were the Darshanikas of those, uh, of those Shastras. And in our case, uh, we are going to talk about Uttara Mimamsa, which we call it as a Vedanta Shastra. So the Purva Mimamsa is, um, Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa go together, but, but I think the Uttara Mimamsa is we, what we call it as a Vedanta Shastra is what we are going to discuss in this session. So we said Pramana, Veda is a Pramana. So what do we, what do we mean by Pramana? Pramana is what we call it as proper means of gaining the correct knowledge. So how many pramanas are there? So there are multiple pramanas are there. I think we, for here, we quote the text from Manasolasa. In the Manasolasa, there, there is a discussion about eight major pramanas and where each shastras, they will say what pramanas will be used in each shastra. 
and what's, how many pramanas used in shastra. This is just a comparison. So since we talked about darshanas, I just took a few darshanas here and say where each pramanas are playing in. So the first one is called the Pratyaksha Pramana, which is very easy for all of us. And we all um, experience that. So which is through our sense organs. So it's perceptions by sense. Something like I see a flower, now I see a phone, I see, I smell the flower, food, I, I hear music. All those Pratyaksha Pramana, all those are called as a Pratyaksha Pramana that we can comprehend by our senses. And the beauty about the Pratyaksha Pramana is it is accepted by all the Shastras. Uh, every Shastra takes it because that is what we consider as real, that what we see. But going beyond that point, some, some things cannot, may not be explained by Pratyaksha Pramana. So what we do there is we sometimes infer. It's a truthful knowledge inference. Um, so inference is something like you walk into a forest and you see everywhere the trees are wet and it's all um, moist and humid. Now, then you infer that, oh, it has rained a few minutes ago. So uh, it is basically concluding based on the, um, what, what, what your previous knowledge is. Well, you know that when, when you, you might have seen it rains in the forest, rain somewhere else and the places that becomes wet. So based on that knowledge, you associate your um, knowledge here and then you come to a conclusion. And the third one um, is Upamana. In the Upamana space, we see that uh, we use an example uh, to come up with an uh, to come up with a knowledge with a knowledge. So um, in this case, uh, for example, if somebody comes and tells you, oh, okay, what is meant by an ape? What is an ape? So I don't have never seen an ape. Is it a fish or is it a donkey or is it uh, you know um, a, a crocodile or something like that? But then um, then we explain to them that it is like a monkey. You know, it has this this features and then you take it and it does not have a tail. And then if this person sees the ape again, now ape next time, okay, and he sees a monkey without a tail, he concludes that uh, ape is a, this is an ape. So that's based on an example. This is Sadrashyanam. So that uh, monkey, monkey becomes a pramana there. The last one, uh, or the, not last one, but the most important of the um, uh, pramanas is what we call as a Shabda Pramana. In this case, we say it is apta vakyam is shabda. So what does it mean? That vakyam, that sentence, that's those sentences which, um, which are trustful, which we rely on, and which care about us. So how do we know that, right? So the Vedas, we consider as them as the apta vakyam because they, ha they have been, they are the trusted source of knowledge. knowledge. And what, do, what, do, what it can do is, I mean, there are a lot of things which are beyond the Pratyaksha Anumana Pramanas. And those are explained in the Vedas. So this it's called, uh, this is a scope of uh, knowledge which is beyond these limitations of the Pratyaksha Anumana Pramana. And we also see that um, it is Atindriya Vishaya. So it's beyond the sense of uh, our Indriyas. That is beyond the sense of our, all the, um, all the in, um, comprehensible parts of knowledge, uh, knowledge sources. And it also is avoid of, uh, it's also devoid of something called, we call it as a Pumbuddhi Dosha. What that means is um, when a human being, when a, when a person is, um, uh, person has, is coming up with some theories or some knowledge base or some stories or whatever it is, there is always a chance of error, confusion, and so on. Uh, in this, in the in the Shabda Pramana of a Veda, we don't see that it is. It's a clear. Its knowledge is very clearly laid out. So these four pramanas, the Pratyaksha, Anumana, Upamana, Shabda Pramana, are widely used across uh, Nyaya Shastra and all the other shastras as well. And uh, this is the uh, this is very highly discussed on the Nyaya Shastra. There are other pramanas like Arthapati, which is a knowledge derived, derived from circumstances. Then Anupalabdhi, where we say the non-existence. And some Baba, which is a subsetting knowledge, which is you say somebody has 100 rupees, you know that he has 10 rupees with him. So this kind of um, knowledges are also used in the Vedanta space. So uh, so these seven knowledges are seven se seven sets of knowledge are used in uh, in in the Vedanta uh, in the Vedanta Shastra. So we see in the Purumimamsha Shastra has two different schools. So one Shastra takes. Um, uh, five sources of knowledge and other sources, other shastra takes six sources of knowledge. 
And this is according to the Manasolasa text. The last one is Aitikyam. The Aitikyam is based on history. Uh, so we say Rama is there, Rama, there lived a king called Rama. And those kind of things are, uh, those knowledge systems, and those, the, that is uh, taken as a source in the Pauranikas and the Sahitya and all those people. They take the eighth uh, source as a knowledge. So what are the texts that are, um, that are used in Vedanta? So how do we learn Vedanta now? So we, we, just, uh, we just need to introduce more things here. So before we go there, we understand what, what are the texts that are available. And the, the basic three texts that are available are called as the Prasthana Grantas. So they are the uh, Upanishads, Brahma Sutras, and the Bhagavad Gita. So uh, Brahma Sutras, Upanishads are part of the Vedas. So the Vedas have four different um, sections in, the, in them. They are uh, Brahmanas, uh, the Samhita, Brahmana, Aranyaka, and Upanishads. Upanishads are the end, towards the end of the Vedas. So that's why it's Anta, so Vedanta. So the Veda, that is the main source of the Vedanta knowledge. Then uh, Maharishi Badarayana came and wrote the Brahma Sutras. Sutras are in capsule format. Uh, so they are shlokas to understand for us. And then uh, Maharishi Veda Vyasa wrote Bhagavad Gita, which also explains the principles of uh, Upanishads. Bhagavad Gita is a part of the Mahabharata. Then we also have a lot of Acharyas who came down the line, and they have written their commentaries on all these Prasthanatraya Granthas. Uh, so we have seen Adi Shankar Acharya, as well as uh, Rama, Rama, Sri Ramanuj Acharya and Sri Madhva Acharya, they have written commentaries on all these texts. And, and uh, there are Prakarana Granthas also, which are um, like what Adi Shankar Acharya has written, something called uh, Veka Chudamani, where he has condensed uh, his uh, the philosophies and given us Upanishadic uh, talks, uh, uh, condensed philosophies of Upanishads. So you see that there is a small um, star over here, whereas this don't have the star. So what is different between the Upanishads and the Brahma Sutra and Bhagavad Gita? So we, we always attribute an author to this Grantha. So we can say Maharishi Bra Brahma Sutra, sorry, Maharishi uh, Bhadarayana wrote the Brahma Sutra and Maharishi Vyasa wrote Bhagavad Gita. So a Purusha, a person has written this text. So this, this Granthas, we call them as Paurusheya Granthas. Uh, similarly, uh, when Adi Shankar Acharya has written Viveka Chudamani, Viveka Chudamani is a Paurusheya Grantha. But in the case of the Vedas, what Urmi Mamsa and the Uttarmi Mamsa Shastrakaras believe is that they are, they are not written by a human being. So what is, the, what is written by a human being mean? So you basically, in a knowledge, when you accumulate the knowledge, you digest it, you come up with your imagination, you add your imagination, and you can write a, grant, you write a text. So Brahma Sutra is from a person, he has been, a person has written it. So his ideas, his knowledge, everything has been implemented in that. Whereas the way in which the Vedas have been revealed to the mankind is the Rishis through their Jnana Drishti, what we call them as, um, with their sadak, sadhanas, they are, they just collected the Vedas and they just gave it to the mankind as it is. So there was no transformation that happened. So since there is no person associated with this knowledge that, that uh, Shastras, we call them as apaurusheya. There is no person associated with that. So we call that as apaurusheya grantas. So that's, uh, that's another term we wanted to introduce here. And Jayanti Ji will be going over uh, apaurusheya in the later part of this um, talk. All right. So with a little introduction on Upanishads, I will um, conclude my portion of the section here. So uh, there are quite a few Upanishads are there. The number is always some um, uh, is always in, in, in uh, question. Some says some says 109 and some say 108, but it's approximately 108 plus is what I would uh, put it as the, the number that I know of. Out of those, uh, ten are considered as Maha Upanishads. Um, so the philosophy of Vedanta is being very highly debated, discussed in the in those ten Upanishads, based on those ten Upanishads which we can remember by a couplet which says isha kena kato prashna munda mandu kete tiri aitareyam cha chandogyam brahadharinyakam tatha 
सो ईशा वासी उपनिषद केनो उपनिषद कठो उपनिषद प्रश्न उपनिषद मुंडको उपनिषद मांडुकी उपनिषद तैत्रिय उपनिषद तैत्रय उपनिषद चांदोग्य मन बृहदारण्य का उपनिषद एस यू कैन सी ऑल दिस उपनिषद आर पार्ट ऑफ वन ऑफ द वेदास and uh, since ajurveda has two branches shukla ajurveda and krishna ajurveda i just highlighted that over there so there are four uh, ajurveda upanishads uh, three atharva veda upanishads two samaveda upanishad and one uh, rigveda upanishad which are considered as the maha upanishads in the upanishads we also see that the the philosophy is explained uh, sometimes we can see that in some of the upanishads we see that it is a dialogue between a two people so in the taitri upanishad vise bhrugur vai varuni hi varunam pitaram upasara so bhrugur son is varuni and he goes his, to his father and asks what is uh, the knowledge that i need to learn also in the mundaka upanishad uh, we see that uh, uh, the sixth son of uh, sixth lineage uh, sixth son in the lineage of brahma goes to his father and asks for uh, the knowledge so and in the uh, keno upanishad also we see that there's a conversation between a, sish, a guru and a disciple and the disciple says i know everything what do i know more and then then the guru explains what the knowledge is and so on so that's the conversation that happens in the upanishad uh, sorry that's the pretext of what upanishad is about and uh, with this um, i'm handing it over to jayanti ji so jayanti ji can you take uh, let me see if i can stop my sharing and see if you can take it over also if you if I, you know, if you have any other questions or if the pace was too fast or something please uh, put it in the chat window i'll try to answer them thank you thank you namaste my name is jayanti um thank you padmanabhan varya for setting the context uh and now i will be taking you to the study of vedanta um the idea here is to if you have a taste of vedanta not so much get into all the details because it is a deep subject so um just give you an overview of vedanta and vedanta addresses a subject called an entity called brahman so the idea is since brahman is an abstract entity i'm going to attempt as much as possible to give you an idea of what this could possibly mean to us um before i start off i want to reinforce the idea of apaurishyam and how vedas are the supreme reference point for vedantins and the reason why i'm i'm stressing on this is since brahman is abstract there is no way we can even try to understand it unless we refer to the vedas so i want to set that very very clearly up front um so i said vedas are the supreme source of valid knowledge as far as the vedantins go vedantins are the seekers of this entity called brahman um and why do they use the vedas um now we are familiar with the five sense organs and the mind that we use to perceive knowledge knowledge that's outside and knowledge um of our own emotions our own thoughts so you know about the five sense organs now these are all externally oriented they go out and seek the object and um, that is what we perceive as um, through our ears eyes nose skin and tongue whereas brahman this entity that we're going to talk about is entirely gained by internal perception the sense organs have nothing to do with it also you will find that in the case of the sense organs um the appropriate sense organ captures the perception pertaining to it for example there is no way the eyes can catch the fragrance of the flowers so that's the example i'm using here to show that our sense organs are not appropriately placed they are not qualified to understand this concept of brahman hence the vedas so having said that context up front we're going to dive into vedanta um i want to mention here that uh, 
I'm going to be talking principally about Advaita Vedanta, not so much because of any leaning towards Advaita, but more because we have, um, it's been the um, subject of our study the last term at MIT. Um, I will be talking about the other schools too, but briefly. Okay, so we said, you, you heard about the Upanishads from Padmanabhan Varya. So Upanishads are the, um, uh, the Uttara, the, the final part of the Vedas that speak of the ultimate truth. Now, it says Jiva Brahmo Bhedaha. That is our subject. The sense of Vedanta is showing the non-difference between me, the individual, and the something called Brahman. The non-difference between the self, the individual soul, and Brahman. Now, so Brahman, what is Brahman? What is the nature of Brahman? The Vedantins, after deep study of this, have said, Nitya Shuddha, Buddha, Mukta, Paramananda, Brahmosmi. So that's how they have come to a discard, to, to a realization of themselves. This means I am eternal, pure, awakened, and free. Eternal, meaning it was never created, Therefore, not never destructible. You cannot create nor destroy it. It is pure, means it has absolutely no attributes. Attributes that we normally have for living, living beings, such as good, bad, ugly, etc. It's awakened because it is sheer knowledge. It is sheer awareness. And hence, it's awakened. It's free. It's free from the cycles of birth and death, and we'll discuss that in detail. And they say Brahman is Satyasya Satyam. It's the ultimate truth. All right, so we're gonna explore Brahman. Now, I'm gonna read out these phrases that I've put down here. From the condition to the unlimited or infinite, from imperfect perception, which is bounded rationality, to perfect knowledge, um, from bondage, that is the karmic chain of birth, rebirth, birth and rebirth, to moksha, or freedom, from separateness to oneness, from the empirical to the absolute. Now, the states on the left that you see, it is condition, imperfect perception, bondage, separateness, and empirical. They are within the scope of our experience today. That's how we know ourselves. Sometimes we don't even know that. Now the states on the right that you see, infinite, perfect knowledge or dimensionless, moksha, oneness, absolute. These actually describe Brahman. This is also the nature of the self. Now you will observe that these states, the right and the left, are diametrically opposite states. Now the ideal states are the ones on the right. And these are what we will attempt to understand because right now they're not within our realm of understanding or even experience, but we will attempt to find out what they represent. So in the forthcoming slides, I will be delving into each of these phrases. Um, my approach is going to be threefold. I will be picking out some Upanishadic doctrines which describe Brahman and then I'll be getting into a brief explanation of what creates the states on the left and what actually causes the destruction of those states leading to the ultimate states on the right. And I will also be sharing um, popularly accepted analogies uh, just so our brains can grasp this concept um, in a limited way. So the first phrase that we spoke about was that we looked at was from the condition to the unlimited. The Upanishadic statement is Satyam Jnanam Anand, Anantam Brahma. The supreme is the truth, ultimate awareness and boundless and finite. This is from the Taittiriya Upanishad. Now, 
conditioned. What do we understand by conditioning? Conditioning, as we understand, is basically a bias or some, you know, some filters that we have based on our experience, our backgrounds, our own prior knowledge of the situation, which we bring into the way we perceive this world around us. And they actually act as impediments to, to how we should actually be seeing this thing. It prevents us from seeing the thing as it is, as it is naturally. Now, how is this conditioning caused in us? And what is this conditioning with respect to Brahman? Now, there are five sheets. This is from the Taitriya Upanishad again. The Upanishad says that we are actually made up of five sheets. You'll see the diagram on your right. So the gross part of it, the gross body, as they call it, is the Annamaya Kosha which is composed of the essence of the food that we eat. Then you have the pranamaya kosha, which is composed of the five airs, which help with the, or they call it the vital sheath. And it helps with, with the physiological functioning of the body, metabolism, etc. Then you have the manomaya kosha, the, um, uh, the emotional body or the mental body, the mental sheath. It is composed of thoughts and emotions. Um, and then you have the Vijnanamaya Kosha, the intellectual body, which actually helps with decisioning. I need to be, and it decides on, on performing some karmas um, um, that are part of good dharma. And then you have the Anandamaya Kosha, which is the bliss body. Now you will find that from the Anamaya to the Anandamaya Kosha, it is an increasing order of subtlety. So the pranamaya kosha, the manomaya kosha, and the vijnanamaya kosha together constitute the subtle body, and the annamaya kosha is the gross body. Now, how do they cause conditioning in us? When I say I am, I'm tall, I'm short, um, I'm fat, I'm actually identifying with the annamaya kosha or the gross body. Similarly, at various points in time, I would identify with my mind. Um, I am sad, I am I'm feeling down. These are all identifications with the mind, with the emotions, or with our thoughts. Identification with the intellect. Um, um, I must, I have decided to perform this yajna. So that is identification with the intellect. Some kind of decisioning. And then, now, all these identifications happen when you're actually transacting with the physical world. The Anandamaya Kosha is active only in deep sleep, in the deep sleep state, when none of these other sheets are active. So the idea is to, is to break this conditioning by identifying with consciousness because consciousness of which you get a glimpse in deep sleep state. After you have slept well, when you wake up, you say, I've slept very well, I feel good, I've slept well, I've had a sound sleep. So that is just a glimpse of the, of the um, let's say the spark of happiness you have experienced in your deep sleep state. The idea is merely to expand on that. So to identification with the consciousness as opposed to identifying with the mind or the body or the intellect is what breaks, helps us break free of this conditioning. I've just given an analogy here. The vast space is the same as a, as a space inside the vessel. So the vessel, the walls of the vessel actually act as delimiters or conditioning the space outside the vast space that you see outside is the same as the space inside. The space inside is no different. Similarly, the consciousness within is no different from the consciousness, consciousness that pervades everything. That is the idea. Okay. Now the next phrase that we looked at was from imperfect to perfect knowledge. Pragyanam Brahma is the Upanishadic statement. Brahman is consciousness from the Aitareya Upanishad. Now, as I said earlier, 
we, there is a, um, when we use our sense organs to perceive the world, there's always this relationship of subject and object. I'm the knower and there is this known. So that is duality. So this is referred to by Vedantins as Maya. Maya is something that actually um, brings duality into whatever we perceive. This is good, this is bad. We're always looking at the world as a pair of opposites with attributes. So that is Maya, as they say. Now, this, this is what they call as ignorance because that is not the true nature of things. The true nature of things is it's permeated by Brahman. So destroying this ignorance, or when I say ignorance, I'm really calling about, I'm re really referring to duality. Breaking free of this duality is what takes us to perfect knowledge. And that is pure consciousness. Um, I just want to briefly mention that um, the Upanishads also sp speak of three states, the waking state, um, the dream state, and the deep sleep state. I spoke about deep sleep very briefly. Now, the waking state is when you see duality. You're constantly operating as subject object. Object is referring to things around you and you're the subject. Now, dream state is actually um, created when you are in sleep. They call it the REM state when you have dreams. Um, and that is really a product of the, the dreams that you have are a product of the mind. The mind already has a storehouse of thoughts and emotions that you've constantly accumulated and merely projects it onto the dream state. Um, so you're still operating in duality or dream. These are illusionary. It's only in the deep sleep state that you're breaking free because none of these, none of the other sheets are active in the deep sleep state. So the idea is to really, and you'll find that consciousness is at the substratum of all these states. It underlines everything. But since there is the mind that is active, the body is active, when you are transacting in the outside world, the consciousness is merely lying low. It's the body and the mind and the emotions and the thoughts that, that supersede. But we know since consciousness lies at the very base of everything, we really want, we, the idea is to identify with that consciousness. Um, and that happens even beyond the deep sleep state. That is what leads us to perfect knowledge. Now the analogy here is the rope is not a snake merely appears so. So when you're walking down and when it's twilight, you see something that's coiled up, that's twirled up and suddenly you draw back, you withdraw and you say, um, that looks like a snake. You merely, from what you know already, you impose that knowledge onto that object because it's twirled up, you know that the snake is normally has, you know, lying in a coil there. So you say it could be a snake. So the idea, when you talk about Brahman, this entity, the idea is merely to break free of imposing this prior knowledge um, onto something that doesn't have attributes. We're next going to talk about bondage to moksha. Another way we can describe Brahman. Mana eva manushya nam karanam bandha moksha yoho. What does it mean? It means the mind alone is the cause of all bondage. Now, when we talk of bondage, what really do we mean? So we, we, are, we are caught in the cycle of birth and death, birth and death happening continuously. Um, I want to pause here and talk about something we're familiar with, which is um, Dharmartha Kama. Now, these are the values that guide us in this world that we live in. Um, they call it the Trivarga. Now, how do they guide us? In all the actions that we do, in the desire, in, in the pursuit of desires that we have, Dharma is like, like the rail tracks. You're constantly running on the rail tracks, as in 
Dharma governs everything that we do. And why do we do the things that we do? In pursuit of happiness. But you will find that in following this Trivarga, the happiness that we get is temporary. Why is it temporary? Because in, from our experience, um, we're happy with something, but we constantly, there's another desire that comes up that we want to satisfy and another desire that comes up. So it's a constant, endless loop of desires. So it's, the happiness is really temporary. Also, the happiness that we get is mixed with suffering. And it's not as if absolute happiness, oh, um, you know, I've, I've, I've come first in my exams. Oh, but I had to put in so many hours of work and it means I have not been able to spend time on other things. So this constantly that asambhinnam sukham, as they say, or sambhinnam sukham, which is, it is mixed with um, dukkha. But we want to move towards a state which is asambhinnam, which is free of that component of dukkha. Also, this happiness that we're talking about is different from uh, at a different place at a different time. You may feel happy in one place. Um, when you move to India, you may not feel the same way about the same things. So it's, it's very relative. Now, this moksha is free of all these limitations that I spoke about. It is permanent. It is absolute. It is not mixed with suffering. And it stays the same at all time, all time, at all time and at, at all places, basically free of space and time. Now, also at this point, I, I spoke about the cycle of births and deaths. You know that every action of ours has a consequence. That's something which is within our scope of experience. But you also know that sometimes we, we have consequences or we are in situations that we have not caused ourselves or it's so it seems. Now, this is because of the karma theory. For every action that has opened up in one janma, they're allocated over several lifetimes. Are you able to hear me? Uh, we lost you for about half a minute, uh, Jayanti ji. Can you just oh. repeat that last whatever you said? Okay, about sure. Karma? sure. Yeah, so I was talking about the karma theory and how for every action, is it much better now, Amit Maudya? Yes. Thanks. So for every action that we perform, there is a bag of karma that accumulates, which is unseen by us. Now, all these bags of karma are not opened at the same time. We don't open it. Like I said, it's unseen. So they're opened over several lifetimes. So they are basically allocated over several lifetimes. Um, and when, and when we go into, an, to, into a new lifetime, when our bodies perish in this lifetime, we go over to the next, it's, we carry the subtle body with us. The gross body is lost in this lifetime, but the subtle body continues with our thoughts and emotions and everything. And then there's a bag of karma that is opened up and then we go through the situations that, we, that we've invited or that we have probably performed, the, the karma that we've performed in the past. Now, how are we going to liberate ourselves from the cycle of birth and deaths? So this, the person that has achieved Brahman or who has realized mm, this state of supreme um, reality, is, is uh, freed from the cycle because there are no more bags for him. The moment he has realized that he's mere consciousness, that he is mere awareness and not the body and not the mind or not the emotion, at that very instant, all the bags get dissolved. He merely has to live out the rest of his life here. That's it. But he lives very, very differently. But he doesn't have to revisit here. He doesn't have to revisit. He doesn't have to come back for, for any future lifetime. And that is how he frees himself from this cycle. And that, that is enabled by Brahman. The analogy I've given here is the ox thinks it is tether, tethered and therefore it does not move until the farmer pretends to untie it from the, bed, from the pet. I think that's, uh, that's something you understand. All right. 
will be doing on time. Okay. From separateness to oneness, the next con is the next description of Brahman that we'll be exploring. Ekameva Advitiyam Brahma. This is from the Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad. Brahman is one without a second. This is one Brahman. Now, here I want to introduce the concept of Srishti or creation as we know it. Now, how, how does creation happen? Creation really stems forth from Brahman, which is eternal, as we said before, pure consciousness. Now, the five elements are first um, created. The five elements this is um, Akasha, um, uh, Jalam, um, Tejas, uh, Vayu, Prithvi. Not necessarily in that order. Akasha, Vayu comes next. So we have the five elements that are first created. And from the five elements, there are um, aspects of the five elements that go to create the subtle body in us. And then these elements combine together and together create the all living beings. And then life is infused into us. The statement from the Upanishads is tat srishtva tam eva anupravishat. That means it created the jivas. Having created the jivas, it entered them. Now, what does this mean? It means that Brahman that really is the source of creation, as we know it, itself entered into life forms, which means the Brahman is in me. So we are using the concept of creation to understand that we are infused with Brahman and that we are really that consciousness. Um, the analogy that we're using here is just as a spider spins forth its web and then consumes it. So this is again a very, very popular analogy. You will notice that the spider just bring fo brings forth the web. It spins its own web from itself and pulls it back to. Similarly, creation is also projected out by Brahman and pulled back. So the creation happens from Brahman and it also withdraws into Brahman at the time of Pralaya. So this is the concept of creation that helps us to understand that there is just one Brahman in all forms that, is, that are created. Then we go on to our probably our last description of Brahman from the empirical to the absolute. Tattvamasi is the Upanishadic statement. You are that. This is the meaning of the statement. It's again from the Chandogya Upanishad. Now, in order to understand what Tattvamasi means, you are that. So what are we talking about here? So in order to understand this, uh, we need to understand the concept of the three states of reality. Now, there's something called the Prati Bahasika state, which is the apparent reality. And the apparent reality really refers to things that we mistakenly understand, as in the case of the oyster shell that we mistake to be silver. Now, this is probably very short-lived short because um, our sense organs are, have light to us, our eyes have light to us. Therefore, we actually mistake it to be silver. But the moment we go up and pick it up and take it to a store to realize from value from it, you know that it is not silver. So that ignorance or that um, wrongful understanding is short-lived. It lives up to, the form, up to the point, true knowledge is, so when I say true knowledge, um, the empirical knowledge is obtained. That is the Prati Bhasika reality. The world that we live in is Vyavaharika. It operates on empirical observations. Empirical, basically referring to our sense organs and our mind. So we use our sense organs to capture the perception of everything around us, to get knowledge of situations, of people. But even this Vyavaharika state becomes illusionary or becomes apparent from the point of view of the absolute reality. As far as the absolute reality is concerned, 
once I know that I'm really the supreme reality, even the things that we see around us, it, it's no longer seeing, no longer tasting, um, no longer hearing, because that same relationship doesn't, doesn't apply, subject object doesn't apply. So even the Vyavaharika reality becomes an apparent reality at that point. So the idea here again is to illustrate that Brahman represents a state of being in the Paramarthika reality. The analogy that I'm drawing here is the oyster shell appears as silver. And similarly, the world that we live in is really um, an oyster shell appearing as silver. That's the idea. Um, as I said earlier, uh, we are talking about um, Advaita Vedanta, which really equates the jiva to Brahman. It says there is really no difference between the jiva and Brahman. So that is a state of non-dualism. There are other schools of Vedanta that also came up, philosophers who have um, based on their own experiences helped us understand how they have related to Brahman, this entity called Brahman. So there is Vishishta. So Advaita Vedanta is by Shankaracharya. Vishishta Advaita is qualified non-dualism, wherein, um, which is again propounded by Ramanujacharya. And he, based on his personal experience with Brahman, uh, has spoken about, um, about the Jiva being an aspect of Brahman, not really, not equated to Brahman, just, just saying that I am an aspect of Brahman. And then you have the Dvaita school, which says that I'm, I'm dependent on Brahman and um, I serve Brahman. So these are again, like I said, based on the, um, how, how different people have related to Brahman and they all coexist without, not, without any conflict. Uh, which is uh, which is so characteristic of Sanatana Dharma. So here um, we go. This concept of Brahman, um, supreme reality, absolute, uh, permanence, eternal, maybe it may sound esoteric to us right now because we we don't live in in that kind of a reality yet. But we can certainly use some of these concepts of Vedanta um, to, to conduct our lives better so that we are free from, from some of the faults created by this conditioning, as I spoke about earlier. Now, first is the Sakshi Bhava. You may have heard about it. It basically means that you are experiencing this world as a witness. You're not identifying with whatever you see with your body or with the mind or intellect. So that is the witness consciousness that you're bringing into, um, into, into every aspect of your life. Now, the Sakshi Bhava is not, is not possible to bring in immediately. All, all that I'm talking about here takes practice takes time. The idea is merely to be aware that there is something which right now, which right now is not in our knowledge, is not within our realm of understanding, but is within our grasp at some point in time. Nishkama karma, which you may have heard of from the Bhagavad Gita. Again, work without expectation of any fruit. The idea is that idea is to minimize the accumulation of these karma bags. Mm -hmm. So you perform whatever you need to perform um, to the best of your ability with complete devotion to the task at hand with no expectations of fruit therefrom. Again, these are all things that we need to work on. They are, you, you will you'll probably have to address it from an incremental uh, perspective because it doesn't happen overnight. Pain without suffering by disidentification. You suffer when your mind gets, when your mind is identified with it. Um, 
But when you disidentify from it, you're merely watching it as a witness and you're not suffering uh, from whatever you're experiencing. Self-inquiry and reflection as to the true nature of the self. The philosophers who come up with these darshanas used self-inquiry. They, they heard about the Brahman from the Vedas and they said, we want to inquire as to what this is. We want to know where we came from. We want to understand what, what we're made of. So that is a process of self-inquiry. Extremely powerful uh, weapon that we can use um, in order to look within ourselves and see at every moment where a particular reaction, where a particular thought or emotion is coming from. Um, this is merely to give you an idea that some of the concepts that we spoke about earlier are indeed uh, capable of being practiced. I just want to end this presentation with uh, a shloka from the Mundaka Upanishad. Dva Suparna Sayuja Sakhaya Samanam Riksham Parishasvajate Tayor Anyaha Pippalam Swadu Atti Anashnan Anyohu Abhichakashiti. Now, this shloka describes the relationship between me and Brahman. Me this jiva actually with all the sheets, um, with various kinds of uh, identifications and conditioning um, with the Brahman, which is free of all these, free of the conditioning and free of the attributes. So the shloka is talking about two birds, uh, the two birds on the tree. One is consuming the fruits of the trees, enjoying the pleasures, some of the fruits are bitter, some of the fruits are sweet. So it is enjoying the pain and it's experiencing the pain and pleasures of eating the fruits. And the other is looking on as a witness. Um, so it is the Sakshi Bhava again that is being exhibited uh, in this shloka. And over a period of time, this jiva as it is able to see that there is the possibility of moving to witness, to the state of being a witness, moving to this other consciousness, realizes that it is really one with that. Um, I just picked up this poem, which describes beautifully this shloka. So I'll, I'll uh, end this presentation here. You can read the poem. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Uh, we'll attempt to answer the questions uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, again, these concepts that I presented are deep concepts, require, require understanding first, require reflection, and that needs time. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Sagaria, for the opportunity. Um, and thank you, Nikunj and uh, IIT Rurki for giving us this opportunity to share with you all uh, what we've studied at MIT on Vedanta. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so uh, we do have some time, about 10, 15 minutes. So uh, whatever questions were asked in the chat, I've tried to answer. But uh, if there are still some more questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, and I will uh, ask you uh, to unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, because typing it now on chat will take more time. So we can, since the speakers have completed presentation, you can directly ask it uh, in audio form. So does anyone have any pending questions? Or if whatever I answered was not uh, uh, complete for you, then you can repeat your question. So Raji has a question saying, what does Sakama Karma Yogi mean or what does he do? Um, I've heard of the concept of Karma Yoga uh, from the Gita again. Now yoga basically means union with this Brahma, merging to the state of consciousness 
or supreme awareness so kama uh, karma karma yoga or or um, achieving it through karma or kriya basically means you um, perform the work that is assigned to you you devote yourself complete to completely to it and in the process um forget that you are the person who's actually doing it that you are the person who actually needs a return from doing it so everything around identification with with um returns from the work performed um i need to be recognized etc drop off you merely perform the work um and merge yourself in the work that you perform that is the karma yoga concept uh, i think that is nishkama karma yoga yeah uh, no, i was asking about I sakama so, so basically uh, sakama karma you attach yourself to the uh, results and you just goes on a cycle right in a nishkama you don't attach to the results right so you don't you just take it up and do it so it's that's uh, that's my understanding um so just to add to that uh, so um like jayanti ji said th- there are basically two so if moksha is your goal then there are two uh, uh, paths to it one is through knowledge and the other is through action so knowledge part is called jnana yoga and uh, uh, the action part is called karma yoga and both these have been uh, well explained in the bhagavad gita now if your goal is not you are not really interested in moksha per se but you still want to have a good life then that is also an option so uh, actually moksha they say that there are different ways of attaining it so one of them is by performing actions consistent with dharma even if it is sakama you can have uh, healthy desires which don't uh, infringe on anybody else's uh you know right so as long as you recognize that you are part of the creation and everybody in it has uh, their own and you respect others uh, right and you for example you don't go and over consume the environment or you don't uh, you know uh, defraud other people you can still have valid desires and you can work towards them so that is a valid purushartha and what it says is by doing so if your karmic baggage gradually reduces then you reach a state where your karma reduces to zero and then you go to a, a loka where eventually when pralaya comes you will merge with the uh, parmatma and you will get moksha that is called uh, 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 krama moksha which is not uh, necessarily based on understanding that you are one with the brahman and all that it doesn't require that so that is also another valid path that is offered by our shastras so Did i think that aspect is what aspect that is what sakama karma yoga means uh, according to me yeah thank you um, amit madai the other aspect that's also spoken about um, um, repeatedly is identifying with a higher purpose not looking at it from a limited perspective of just yourself this higher purpose again as amit madai said uh in line with what the dharma shastras have spoken of in line with the um the expectation that you are whatever you doing whatever karma sacrifices ceremonies that you're doing are really for the welfare of the larger good the society the community and the world so that's that's the other perspective that's also offered in the hmm. then question is karma is destroyed on the realization of brahman is this stated somewhere and what is the logic here so um yes it is stated in the advaita vedanta i think it's a, it requires a very long explanation i don't know if i can do it in 2 minutes but uh, the answer to that is yes uh, basically when uh, we can think about in another way i mean maybe if, if you want to think it in one way once you realize or once you um, once you are part of the part of the brahman you are not associating with your actions so that is you just live a life as as how the existence happens so when you are doing that way the the karma the attachments and detachments don't bother you so whatever you like about it or whatever you don't like about likes and dislikes don't bother you you are just in a different state um so that that is what the logic is that is um, discussed in the advaita vedanta yeah so as long as you are experiencing a separateness from the creation uh you will have 
a tendency to say, I don't have this, therefore I want it. I don't have that, therefore I want it. And you will keep on working towards that. And once when something is fulfilled, you'll get one more desire and so on. There's no end to it. But if you experience that you are one with the Brahman, then everything in the creation is you. It is not different. So then, the, then you can work freely without having that constant thing that I don't have this. You don't experience a feel of uh, a lack of anything. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, therefore, uh, though you are doing all the things that you would normally do, you don't experience that. Uh, uh, exp the, the, it is not a karma anymore because it doesn't bind you anymore. So that is the idea. And uh, what they say is that this is uh, if you have attained this state while you are alive, then you are like a person. So the analogy they give is like a child uh, who plays with a rubber snake. Now he knows that it's not a real snake, it's a rubber snake. But still he's able to use that rubber snake as if it's a real snake to scare other children just for fun as a play thing. So he's able to uh, simultaneously coexist in both realities. So the artificial reality, which what we call Maya, he's still in the physical form. So he experiences that, but he knows that that's not the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is that he's one with Brahman, which is called yoga. I mean, yoga means you're connected to that reality. So once you have that, then you can still uh, play with both the realities at the same time. So that's what it is about. So uh, thank you, Amit Mahadaya and Padmanabhanwari. So I also want to add here that they use the comparison of this person who's attained while still alive. Um, so when he's realized Brahman, that his true nature is actually this, this Brahman, this consciousness, he stops seeing the world as a multiplicity of names and forms. He sees in everything just Brahman. He doesn't see, you know, in a person, a person who is tall, who's, uh, who's not been good to him in the past. No, he sees him just as Brahman. The, the comparison they draw here is that of an... So the, so the question was, do karmas dissolve? All the sanchita karmas, the karmas that actually spill over to the other lifetimes, completely dissolve at that point. But he still has to live out the rest of his life. So the prarabdha still continues, still exhausted in this life. That situation is compared to an arrow. When it is released from the bow, it, it hits the target and continues on till the momentum is completely stopped. The momentum reaches zero. Similarly, this individual who is one with Brahman, who's, who's already attained that state, will not come back for another lifetime, but he will live out the rest of his life, um, but in a very, very different way. Uh, there was one question, which is karma just one of the theories. So I answered it saying many of the uh, darshanas accept karma. Um, but if you want to add anything else to that, you can. Uh, um, so when you say the, dharm, is, the, is, is dharma, dharma. mere is the theory? Not dharma, karma. Karma. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, is it a theory? So, oh, okay. Because I mentioned the theory of karma. Karma, yes. Um, so that is, is that in connection with the moksha slide that I put up? What is the context? I think you had a slide somewhere where you said uh, it's a theory of karma. That's why the question is saying, is it just a theory? Or is when it just say, one of the theories? I think most of the darshanas accept karma. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the basis because for that you, is... Unless, unless uh, Charvaka, for instance, which just says that this is the only life. If you accept that there is a life beyond what is the current one, then only a karma theory can uh, make sense out of it. Why would you have multiple lives uh, if there is no karma involved? You know, So the only way you can right. actually explain multiple lives, once you accept that there is something beyond the current life is through karma theory in one form or the other. So, right. So except for the charvakas who are only looking at life at the present, only life in this lifetime, um, the other darshanas, um, even Purva Mimamsa, is looking at the Atma. For all the uh, desires that they want fulfilled, going to Swarga, is also to do with the Atma. This Atma will experience Swarga later. Therefore, I need to perform this sacrifice. So they all believe uh, that the, it is the Atma that continues. 
how else would you explain that there is such a difference in between me and somebody else not all of us go through the same situations not all of us are born into the same background or into the same economic uh, status so the karma theory explains the differences that we see around us yeah so i think the next question <clears throat> Uh, on the differentiation of uh, prarabdha agami and sanchita uma ji has answered that question and before that, i saw a question on tattvamasi so the tattvamasi is a great statement can it be explained simply how can i practice any examples right i mean tattvamasi is that I mean, simply that is whatever that is that you is is a simple translation that we can say for both that now how do you practice it again uh, there are four mahavakyas in the uh, in the vedanta shastra so Let me see if I remember all. Pranayam Brahma, Tattva Masi, Aham Brahma Asmi, and uh, uh, I usually remember Jayanti Ji, Amit Ji. If you know the fourth one, Sarvam Kalu Idam Brahma. Ah, okay. So these are all the Mahavakyas which come from different Vedas. Um, each Mahavakya comes from a Veda. So that uh, it is, uh, it is only through practice. I mean, it's only through um, deep studies of the Vedanta structures, Vedanta knowledge. You get it. and how do you study the vedanta knowledge is also has been mentioned i think we will be covering if in the second section of this talk so basically uh, you uh, the 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 what we have given is an introduction to vedanta next is how we explore and how we understand all those things it's very it is very nice that you ask this question that tattva masi how can i practice i mean it's 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 a level higher than understanding vedanta which is nice so the the way in which we uh, you are supposed to study vedanta shastra is you go to a guru and learn and say it because it's a upanishad means you just go to the guru and uh, the mean upanishad means you go near so near who a near to a guru and that guru is uh, a shrotriyam brahmanishta a person who has learned all the vedanta and he practices that so you have to learn the vedanta through a guru and uh, it just comes over a period of time so if i had answered your question um, otherwise uh, jayanti ji and amit if you want to add something you can please go ahead and add uh, one thing i would like to add is uh, even uh, while you are looking for a guru you can even start on your own by uh, the method that jayanti ji hinted at which is basically to reflect on who am i really uh, is it just my when i say uh, my body that means i am different from the body right just like when i say i have a i have a mobile i am not the mobile so if i say my body and i am not my body similarly when i say i am my mind clearly i am not my mind so then what am i so that leads you to re- reflect that maybe there is a third level which is prob- what you can call the soul or atma or whatever uh, which may be a part of your uh, true self and uh, one way to do it is to go behind beyond your normal comfort level all of us when she talked about conditioning it refer, refers to the comfort level in which we locate ourselves and we are comfortable with that uh, so there are ways in which you can go beyond your comfort level whether it's phys- many people do it at the physical level like they go bungee jumping they go uh, trekking and so on where they explore some physical aspect which is beyond their normal life and in brief one brief moment they expect they experience that there is something beyond my everyday experience and then that uh, can become more and more sustained similarly you can go beyond your normal comfort level of the mind by taking on new projects uh, new challenges which you are not experienced before you have no idea how to deal with it but you still overcome it so that also leads to your essentially it's about consciously trying to reflect yourself which is called swadhyaya and also about trying to consciously become a better person uh, by uh, recognizing your limitations observing them and then gradually through awareness uh, moving beyond them and part of it is taking on new experiences so that if from just like uh, physical exercise for the body and uh, puzzle solving for the mind new experiences is how the soul uh, keeps itself recharged so constantly taking new experiences which are beyond your comfort zone and then trying to learn from it is one way to experience more of the fact that you are not just a body and mind but also an atma okay so um the question swadhyaya before i go back to tatvamasi i just wanted to add some more on tatvamasi because it was a question swadhyaya is basically self effort uh, as per the shastras it means going to a guru 
as Padmanabhan Mahadev described, sitting by him. And there are certain qualifications for the seeker. There are certain practices prescribed for the seeker. Viraga, Vaira, um, um, distancing, dispassion, um, Nitya Nitya, um, uh, Vivekaha. So these are all the qualifications that are required for the seeker. But essentially it means this is a work that you need to do yourself for yourself. Mm. This word Adhyaya, Adhyana of the self. So it's Correct. like self-reflection. So you put aside all the normal everyday noise. Oh, I have to do this, I have to do that, and all worries about your everyday work life, family life, etc. You just consciously keep it aside for a moment and just be in silence. Maybe just initially listen to some music or after some time you can even drop that and just be in silence. And then you will find that it's like when they say if, with, if the pond, there are constantly uh, pebbles dropping into it, the water will be always disturbed. So you can't see anything. But if you, if you allow the pond to settle, the water to settle, then it will start reflecting. So same way, when you allow your mind to be silent from the everyday noise, then you will start seeing the reflection of real, uh, the reality in your own self. That is called Swadhyaya. So and of course, go. having a having a guru helps greatly because they will help you to accelerate the process of conditioning, and they will put you through experiences where you challenge yourself, and you'll point out when you are going wrong and all that. So definitely, that helps. So just to go back to Tattva Masi, the comparison that is used or the, the analogy that is used for better grasp of this concept of Tattva Masi is Suvayam Devadattaha. That means the person that I saw 10 days ago in India um, in the morning is the same Devadatta that is standing before me here in New York um, this morning. How am I going to reconcile somebody that I saw in India at a different time place to somebody that I'm seeing here? Saha, I am. These are two different um, references. So Tattva Masi merely collapses time and place, takes out the concept of time, takes out the attribute of time and place from these two references and says, this person is the same. It is the same Devadatta. That's how you recognize him. So when I take out the attributes, time and place attached to the two ends, the one that I saw in India at some time of the day, the one I'm seeing here in front of me now, when I take out, it is the same person. So, so with Brahman, um, what I'm seeing before me, the name and form, is this, it's the same Brahman. It's just that the attributes are imposed on it because of the way I'm looking at it. So just practicing that, who, who is this? It, it, is a, it is the same Brahman. I am merely seeing this Brahman as different. Just practicing this from moment to moment um, is, is what Vedanta talks about. Okay. If there are no further questions, I think we are reaching the time limit also. So uh, I just want to thank everyone. And uh, just want to point out that if you are already registered for this, then you will receive the email about the link to this recording, as well as the PPT and a feedback form. Uh, once the editing is complete, they'll send that out in a few days. And uh, this uh, will also be archived on the uh, YouTube channel of the uh, Sanskrit Club of IITR, like all the other uh, sessions. So if you uh, enjoyed this and found some value, then do tune in for the remainder of this series. This is the fifth in the series of uh, talks on Shastra Setu, which is about uh, creating a bridge between the Shastras and the uh, for people from a science, engineering and technology background. So we hope you enjoyed this. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, Namaste, Vibhya. Namaste, Vibhya. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.